Well, I forgot again to record the beginning of our meeting. Uh, so, just to give you some background explanation, uh, Gary was facing dilemma. Uh, he runs a business in Indonesia uh, during the coronavirus uh, crisis. Uh, it was very likely that he was going to have to lay off employees. And so he posted on a secular Buddhism Facebook forum at the following dilemma. Captain Gotama has a ship with five officers, 65 crew, plus about 150 family members of the officers and crew. The ship is in the middle of the ocean in a vicious storm and is taking on water fast. There is no help available, no government, no coast guard. And all the other ships in the vicinity are in the same situation. The only way to save the ship is to drastically and quickly reduce the weight of the vessel. The weight being the people on board. A 35% reduction in the number of people on board would probably buy enough time to save the vessel and the other 65%. Decisive action must be taken. What does Captain Gotama do? Gary and I had been discussing options and then Elfie summarised the position. No, okay, Gotama would not be the, the captain but he would be maybe someone the captain phones up as a friend. And um, and what we learned that Dharma should all be about, what actually do we do? Um, and that might be leadership, that might be. Because at the moment, I bet they're all looking at you um, and, and think that you should come up with a bright saving idea. I, I, I wouldn't expect anything else because you you uh, you built it up you have always been that leader figure even if you have associates and um and at the moment they just say well he figure it out you know he will save us all i bet they do and why not i mean that's oh, just do. human hmm? yeah yeah yeah, yeah. They, they so I, I can really understand that, you know, because <laughs> that's what my guys do at the moment with me too. And I always thought I had a collaborative affair going on where we all just kind of chip in. But at the moment, they're not interested in collaborative affairs. They say, Elfie, just figure it out, will you? <laughs> and let us know when you've done that. And then, <laughs> yeah. Hmm. So I, I get that. It's interesting and, that, in <laughs> fact, what you did, Gary, by posting it on a forum was, in fact, just that thing. Because you were, that was really your phone call. That was, you're yeah. saying. Oh, interesting, yes. You were saying, well, look, here is a dilemma. Here is the captain in a dilemma. What's, yeah. what, what, as secular Buddhists, are you suggesting? Oh, that's cool. So, but in fact, they all—they <laughs> they didn't sort of respond in the way that you perhaps, why, you know, to the phone call. They—they they weren't really sort of thinking. Ah, right. Well, I'm not coming up with them. Um, this is this is how. Well, this is what, perhaps, is the course of action. As it, but they were sort of just decrying the the message. By me, wherever we've already. It says we're going to run out of time in 10 minutes. I'm going to have to set up a new meeting and thing. So, so give me a moment while I... Yeah, I'd, I'd really get that, the, the, that it is, posting it like that. I thought it was, when you just posted it to us, I thought that was really brave and, and amazing. Well, I no. thought I'd, I'd, I'd test it on you first, and if it, if it didn't sort of completely go down, badly I, I'll, I'll post it on Facebook to sort of see where people yeah. took it. Yeah I thought that would because it's I, I it's a real so this is this is the situ, this is a real situation so you know you know it I yeah I like that what Rupert just said it is like asking the Buddha you know because um you could say there should be some consensus, maybe even, you know, if, if there is a Dharma, is there a consensus? It's at least a worthwhile question. Um, how, how well would it advise us in the event? Um, how much of a consensus would there be? Do we all freak out and say, 
just just meditate more uh, or um, or would it actually uh, come up with very clear guidelines? It's all interesting. And, and, and uh, what you seem to have gotten is quite a diverse answer <laughs> from abuse to uh, yeah. all of, a man or all of it, really. So the consent. Well, <laughs> yeah. yeah, what's indicative of this post that I put on Facebook is that it got 83 comments and two likes. <laughs> it's usually the other way around. <laughs> Uh, so a lot of wow. people read it and thought, no, I'm not going to that, I'm not, or, or they just sort, sort of got locked into it and couldn't let go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so what is, the, what is the majority? What did the majority advise you to do? Well, they didn't advise me to do anything useful. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> That's the problem. They sort of, you know, went floating uh -huh. off. The, uh, <laughs> they just... They <laughs> so, but anyway, the, the moderator closed it for further comments and there, was, and there was sort of calls for me to be sort of you know, banned because I was a troll. I mean, I am a troll, but that's not the point. Um, I wasn't being abusive, so I really can't see it. Uh, mm. you know, I, it, that's not the first time that's happened. I mean, I've been sort of had posts deleted before, yeah, for being, I think, well, I think this might be perceived as being abrasive. Hmm. Well, it's provocative. Yeah, there provocative shouldn't be anything, that, there shouldn't be anything wrong with provocative, hmm. I think. Yeah, that's right. You know, that's because right. that means provoke you to think. And and aren't we 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 all about that, aren't we? About thinking, I, I would hope so. yeah. and not believing. But it's okay. What is a what is the rational approach and the creative approach? And I think they always come together because I really mean that if we are in a stressful situation and uh, in this polarized mind state where it's either or, where it's life or death, where it, where it gets uh, polarized in that way. You know, I chuck them overboard, they will die. Uh, and it's black and white. Then our creativity shuts down. So to be mm -hmm. a rational means creative because rational would mean, okay, that it was great to explain it like that, and now the reality will be that it is a shade of gray. How can we, uh, and then the creative creativity can flourish. Like when Rupert then came up, can the ones that stay set up a food bank that the others can access? In, but then everyone can contribute as much as they can afford without any stigma to it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and and you can show your solidarity and your generosity in a really um, uh, beautiful way and and the others feel that they're not cast off um, and, and it's I thought that was as soon as you come out of the black and white and they they either with us or not with us I, I thought that was a really fantastic rational creative way of at least starting to think about it and that might not be the right way but if you give an example like that uh, to the group they might come up with a superior way that i could we couldn't even think about but they would know what might really help even better so but it is it's a that is leadership i think to to give an example, to talk, to, okay, what would everyone need? Talk me through it, the invitation to listen, because a lot of people get great ideas when they kind of talk it through it. So it's, a, it's being there as a listening post for people to work it out themselves and to give an example which, along which line something could happen because then sure enough, someone will pipe up and say, okay, well, that's great, but actually I would think this would work better. And, and it's, so it's, it's to be the, that precipitation point where others, other people's creativity can be articulated. 
that is leadership for me. Mm -hmm. that I, I'd, in a situation like this, because no one mind can have a satisfactory answer here. I think mm -hmm. one has to pool here, pool minds from all the different stratas, the ones who have the finances in mind, the ones that, that look after the well-being of the company, but also the ones that might just get chucked out um, and has a real existential fear and everyone in between. Uh, when, when you pool all those needs and minds and give them a platform, that's where magic can happen. Mm -hmm. yes, how, well, how... I, I'm sort of hoping that would happen, yes, but I'm, I'm not sure how. They meant forcing them to sort of confront the situation. Um, well, I was basically forcing them to say, you know, you better start using your brains now. You know, don't wait. <laughs> So, yeah. Um, and uh, I think that they have started to do that. I've got some good stuff back from a few people. Um, cool. Just promotional. Basically, these aren't solutions, these are just things that have to be done. And they seem to be doing a little bit better than usual. So, who knows? I think, I think they're energized and yeah. motivated. Oh, oh, isn't that a fantastic outcome? Mm. Now so that is now, leadership in a situation like that. What, what, being able to sit on my yacht and watch them do all the work. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I'm doing. That didn't get well, no, actually, that's, that's, Yeah. What, what, just sitting on my boat and waiting for them to, to come up with a solution. That's, that's really uh, absolutely. Fun. I think that is fantastic. That can be part of absolutely fantastic leadership. Certainly seems to be what Godama did. He just went and had a meditate on him to say, you, you get on with it while I go and sit under this tree. Mm -hmm. But he steered them before he orientated them and he gave them a platform on which to, uh, you know, to um, see it's, it's always, we always, especially, you know, in our group, uh, in the whole group, and you know, we have, we were all thinkers. So there's good brains going on. A lot of extrovert people, they're different from you, Gary, I think. You know, they can only think something through in the presence of another. They can do it only, they are good brainstormers in a group. Uh, they go, oh yeah, and that, and that, and that, you know. What I was interested in what you were saying was about the creative bit, the creativity, because I, I don't see that in after Buddhism or in anything that I've read about Gautama, and I, I'm not actually getting it in the Hellenistic, the Hellenistic philosophy, early Hellenistic philosophy, which I'm reading so far. Because what you were saying is a sort of, it seems to be part of something that we do in our culture, which is to open up to group creativity or individual creativity, and we think it's very important, and it offers solution. I don't see any examples of that in in the stuff we've been doing there has been it's being presented and then saying is this does this work does this work for you look at it from a rational point of view but there isn't i don't think i can't think of examples where what you've just been talking about has been presented as a way forward well wouldn't you say when the when the uh, chief uh, and entangles himself so he can't come back up again uh, that was a, his creative solution to the dilemma of his whole people going, uh, being killed. It was. So <laughs> I mean, it's, a, it's a pretty final one too. But yeah. <laughs> so, so you're, do you see that as within the guidance of Gautama saying that you need to come up with a creative solution? In a totally un, in a, uh, unarticulated way. Possibly. You know, no one says, I, I'm all about setting you free to uh, find an ethical, creative solution. No one says that. And maybe, you know, and from, you have for a long time act, uh, uh, articulated that in the group, in the big group, in the, in, with Stephen, that where's creativity here? And it hasn't been very articulated there either. For me, it, it culminates more and more in this, com in this combination of 
rational and creative. And the two actually always coming together because the opposite is, in the, well, many think blind face or, or um, stereotypical answers or um, irrational, just standard solutions, moral stuff, basically, Ten Commandments, whatever it is, that fits 100 times not for the one time it would fit. You know? And that is, for me, now secular dharma, because uh, uh, religion is, is, the, is the opposite. It is standard moral you know, precepts, do this, don't do that, a belief thing. Not rational. No, thinking is discouraged. The, the the divine spark will hit you in good time. And, uh, um, when actually the, the the neuro scientific way for me would be okay. Come out of that panic state so that you can think clearly. Come out of the emotional thing so that you can think clearly and your creativity is flowing. Okay, I've got two two other questions. One is the relationship of rational thought to creative thought. And the other question is the relationship of those two, rational thought and creative thought, to ethics. Because if the Dharma offers an ethical structure, where does that come from? Well, I think it, it's a creation. And, well, and who's, hmm. is it, is, so yeah, the question is, I suppose, who is it, whose creation is it? Is it our creation? And do we find the creation through rational, creative thought processes? Or is it something that is embodied in Dharma? I think thinking rationally is, is you know, in some ways, thinking creatively also, but it's more about new connections or, or, or new synthesis uh, or new ways of looking at things. Um, so it's still rational, it's not uh, creative thinking doesn't necessarily have to be termed irrational. Um, I mean, when you're, you know, ethics, you know, as, as we say, I, I, or I think as we feel is, is uh, situational, and, the, and, the, and at those moments when you need to, to sort of make judgments or decisions, um, it's usually best to, to try and let go of everything, you know, your own interests, uh, their interests. Look, look at, forget everybody's interests and just focus on the problem. And when you let go of all those things, you know, creative solutions can, can emerge. If I try to hold on to sort of my own interests in a particular issue, it would skewer my, 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 it would basically cut off, you know, that section of my brain that was sort of dealing with that, with my own interests. And, and the same goes for trying to sort of guard the interests of others or, you know, narrow self-interests I'm talking about, looking at the picture as a, as a whole forgetting all the, the vested interest and the, you know, the background noise, you can make, uh, I think, judgments that are, are sound and therefore creative. Yeah, I can see, I can all of that. I, I sort of understand all of that. What, but how, how is that related to ethics? I, is the assumption that there what comes out will be ethical or is there some form of embedded ethics as what you were saying before about the leadership within buddhism within what Gautama was saying that there is a it is, it's 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 an, an ethical system which is pretty much what stephen says that he he sees secular dharma as presenting an ethical way of, of, of living, which means it's sort of, it's embodied within the teaching, that it isn't a thing that you would come to without the Dharma. And I, I've always sort of struggled 
with whether whether this is whether this could be shown to be the the case or whether you just have teaching and from the teaching this is thinking structures and in those thinking these ways of thinking we will come to the an ethical viewpoint which is a sort a, sh, a sort of shared ethical viewpoint which has some sort of level of universal truth although i hate using the, the word truth yes yes that, that's always a problem truth um and you know I, i'm beginning i mean i think a lot of these things which we consider to be innate you know some degree i think to a great degree you know wisdom is innate you know whether whether by genetic or cultural means you know it becomes you know part of us we know the difference between what is good and what is perhaps not so good um and when and we know how to judge situations in the absence of the laws and morals um i think humans know how to do that um well uh, uh, but once again we have this this very fundamental problem that you know not everybody is the same you know i i you know of the, of the opinion with very few supporting facts <laughs> but you know we're talking about you know probably i, I would guess that you know i, I would classify maybe 25% of the human population as being possibly incapable of understanding or wanting to understand um a dynamic approach to life and you know you have another 25% that perhaps you know we we can see this way we can see this path this is a good way to go and then you've got all the you know the middle is in the middle we sort of going to be pulled both ways that's sort of how i'm thinking about it at the moment you know it's it's not a universal way it it's a particular way for particular people who think that if you want to take a uh, some sort of ethical leadership within the culture it still hasn't answered the question of where the ethics come from other than what you were saying before that you think that there is a universal yeah this is good and this isn't so good and it in yet it can't be universal if there's only sort of 25% of the people who think that this is probably universal because that isn't universal it's just a percentage so i'm um, that's where i i can see that i can see that within a particular context or within a particular culture we could sort of say yeah we think this is the right thing to do in fact that's that's what we we do and we have laws that we make laws and we sort of generally abide by them and agree that they're the they're the correct laws and then they change over time that doesn't mean there's any universality about them there might be some fundamentals which are to do with humans i'm not sure that's the same as an ethical system a, a system which works out ethics if you like so if we've got and i i sort of broadly agree that there's probably you've been but the percentages are right and you know that doesn't really matter it, yes that there are some people who are interested in this and and they that's useful it's just whether different philo philosophical systems come to the same conclusion or should come to the same conclusion because clearly they don't different philos philosophical ideas have different ethical outcomes and i'm not sure that's the same as the dharma i think this is what i'm coming down to i'm not sure i think for me somehow the dharma is more to do with a thinking approach than it is to do with an ethical approach i think this is where my problem comes well, from it's a, a cognitive approach yeah engaging your cognitive facilities to sort of uh, exercise a little bit of control over your impulsive reactive behavior so yeah, that, that's that's, 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 that's certainly part of it yes that's part of it and there are other elements which are also part of it yeah it sort of builds up into a into an overview of this is a good way of of existing mm -hmm. it's not the same as ethics i don't think not for me anyway that at the moment 
and every time I think it is, I think there's something wrong. <laughs> because it seems like an imposition. The, the ethics seems like a rule. Isn't the ethics just the applied, the appliedness of the theories? Of, of what you say, the, the thinking, the right thinking and the creative thinking and then ethics spells it out what that might, you know, ethics precipitates onto a specific problem like... Yes, I think that's how it works for me, yeah, but that means yeah. there's no universality within it. Absolutely no, of course. I, I, would, I would throw that overboard. There is no universality. Not even, you know, even our, our, what, what the, the Bible would say or the, you know, the, the, the absolute holiness of life, human life, for example. We are absolutely ready to negotiate, aren't we? I mean, war and uh, unborn ch children, <laughs> babies and, and stuff. We negotiate that all the time. And so I can't see that there is anything that is agreed as fundamental and always so. I, I, so the universal truth, where is it? I do not see it. But searching for, for truth is always going to lead nowhere. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, and it's not creative. And what if, you know, so, so what if the Dharma really were talking about, so the three first tasks, the cognitive way of freeing your thinking space, right? So that you're not in the thralls of reactivity. You're now in the nirvanic space, right? Where it's spacious and open. And then it's the fourth task is not about write this, write that in this ethical way that we usually interpret it. But what if write, which is always, you know, already a discussion of what that translation should be from the Pali. What if it was never right, but what if it was always creative? Creative seeing, creative speech, creative da da da. What if the right translation would be creative and not right uh, or whatever else was because then I get it together now there's, ra there's the rational side of the cognitive process of getting into a place where that is even possible and then it's about making something of it creativity in all these different ways of being in the world seeing creative seeing creative speech creative um, um livelihood create everything how about that i somehow i know that creative thinking as a process is different from rational thinking and yet they have to work together but i don't think they work together at the same time i think you you stop one way of thinking and then you have another way of thinking and then you come back to the other way of thinking. They stay as su a support structure because without the rational, you can end up with irrational outcomes. When I used to teach creativity, I'd say to students that they should stop thinking about rational. They should stop rational outcomes because if you, if you, are always saying, oh, that isn't going to work, or this isn't going to work, then it stops the creative thinking. So the creative thinking is, allows the impossible, the, the, the irrational, and that can offer opportunities, it can offer pathways, it can offer insights, which always referring to the rational doesn't. But you have to have the rational. You have to bring back to the rational in order to make things work within a rational world. So uh, then you, oh, you can I can I can, can I just yeah. interfere? Sorry. Of course. <laughs> rational has been redefined um, because it used to be exactly like you um, say. You know, a very narrow way of what is not creative but rational. Rational as opposed to emotional. Rational in that, oh, that's irrational uh, or rational, that won't work way. Um, and it has been, that's now called functional <laughs> because rational doesn't get, let go of any of that. Rational is only like if you were to put the three, the first three tasks into 
action. That would be the new way of, of saying rational. So it is, it's not letting go, it's not letting go of emotions, it's only letting go of reactivity. It's not letting go, and it doesn't say that's, um, so the, when I say rational, I don't mean the old fashioned way of saying, you know, uh, the, the opposite of irrational or the very, uh, or unemotional or all that, sorry. That is, that is a definition point now. So when I say rational thought, mm -hmm. I mean clear thinking in the way of the first three tasks. Getting into that place of, of meta-awareness, of not being bound by emotions, but not having to not regard them. Not, oh God, it's so difficult. I'm, I'm waffling now. <laughs> <laughs> It, rational, like we used it uh, before when we, we when we, um, there was a discussion when we, um, you know, should it be about belief? And we said, no, we want, we want, ah, maybe reasoning is, is a, a better word that would, would you be happier with reasoning? You know, not to say goodbye to reason that kind of rational. Uh, yeah, if you like. Yeah, it, it is difficult using. I, I mean, I, I could say that actually you know, reasoning is part of create, creative thought. Yeah, um, well, that's so, then. No, I'm, that, I'm, tr I'm trying to think yeah. that, that if you want, if you, if you're doing, I know, if you're doing programming, because I've just been uh. looking at programming, then <laughs> if you make a mistake in the programming, it's not going to work. Uh -huh. And you press, you then press return, it's not going to work. You'll get an error message. Right? So because mm. there is a logic yeah. here, and if you, if you mm. don't follow it, it's not going to work. Mm. Mm. So we'll say, we'll call it programming, we'll call it that sort of logical process. And that way of thinking about things, you, you think this, if I do this, then this is going to work. And if I do that, that's going to work. And this is going to produce that outcome. So that's what I'm referring to when I was talking about um, rational thought. Okay. And, and okay. I, I don't think yeah. reasoning really is a, is another one, but we could use logic. But I think logic is a bit too too narrow. But anyway, I, what I'm saying is that you can suspend that for a time and think in a different way, and to think in a way that doesn't require, in fact, requires you not to think in that logical way, because it has to allow you to think um, of the impossible it has you have to work in a in a world in a, in a and i think you obviously you can but you have but you can't always think in that way you have to bring back the logic you have to bring back the what i'm calling rational in order to have um, outcomes that work in the world and it is those two processes that work together but they are different. And what I'm trying to get to is it is that what is that process what produces the ethics? And I think I think I'm sort of answering that. And if if there is no universality within ethics, then I think it must be. Hmm. So it is that what we're looking at as being sort of fundamentals within the Dharma? Is it the thinking processes? and the adaption of thinking processes to situations, which is Dharma or part or you know, a significant element of Dharma. The ability to be able to think about things in different ways and relate those things together. Are they part of what Dharma is? Totally, for me, totally. That's what Dharma is. I think I followed you there, right there. Yeah. I think there's it's a problem the, with hmm? ethics. Yeah. Um, I think there's a, a, a problem with this word ethics in as much as, as I mean, although ethics may have many commonalities amongst a great number of different human population. I mean, I think the essence of, of Dharma is, in terms of ethics, is, is situational ethics. It doesn't really matter what those what the Eightfold Path says, it's pretty irrelevant because you, know, you should know in that situation, uh, given the current sort of uh, 
uh, environment you might be in that there is a right or a, a more correct way or, or an appropriate way of responding. It's, you don't sort of nail it down to sort of, you know, right speech or right action or whatever. Or whatever. It's simply the, the, the most appropriate response to a situation. And the, the most appropriate the response, of course, is guided by, I guess, universal principles, probably not, of compassion. A compassion is ethics, isn't it? I mean, that's, a comp that's an element of ethics. Or it, I think it would be it's the starting point. Why have ethics at all if there was no compassion? Uh, good point. Well, that's very interesting. That's a very interesting question. I don't know if Cass... I don't see... I see the... And if if I if I see those steps of the of the the tasks the three tasks as getting me into a certain mind state, I see compassion arising in that process rather than compassion being there like first principle. If one really sees the human condition clearly, and one sees one's own shortcomings. Uh, one sees one's own vulnerability uh, in, in all those ways, maybe also from our biology. I don't know, the, the compassion arises in that process. I'm just wondering whether compassion means more than one thing, because <laughs> there is to be compassionate, but that a sort of assumes that it means the same thing for everybody. And clearly it doesn't. I mean, quite clearly. Somebody might well think that a, a process that they should do, what you should follow, is compassionate. And somebody else, given exactly the same conditions, would say it's compassionate to do the exact opposite. So how is the word compassionate useful? Just for instance, we're in this position now. The world is in this position, and it's coming to a head First of all, in America, but it's going to happen to everywhere. And that's the, the question is, you have, we have two ways forward. We can look after people and try and stop them dying. Or we can look after the economy and try and stop perhaps more people dying because they, if the economy crashes, that's going to affect more people. If there's no economy, there's no hospitals, more people will die. And I think it's going to get more polarized um, but it's going to start with trump because he's already saying that it's going be he's going to put america back to work and if he does this then the physicians are saying that more people are going to die but then other people other countries will have different responses is it that the economists are being are not being compassionate or is it that the phys physicians are not being compassionate because they're not thinking long term. And I, my point is that I that is it is the word itself useful if it can be applied in if both if you can see the point of view that both sides can be saying we're being compassionate whether you actually believe they are or not because you're already on one side. Have, you, have I ever spoken to you about my views on refugees? Yes, I think I've made myself a popular yeah. before. Yeah, yeah, um, no, you've, we, you've, you've, you've certainly <laughs> talked to me about it. <laughs> okay, because um, I think it's, a, it's a, a good example of what you're talking about. There's just different levels to this. I mean, if you had a, a refugee right in front of your face, and I have them in front of my face constantly, you know, they're just part of the environment. I mean, do I behave compassionately towards that person? Well, of course I do. But then I've got a, you know, there's an Australian government that sort of, you know, brought down the shutters and sort of said, you know, anybody arriving in Australia by boat from now on is going to get sent to, to purgatory. Um, and that's what they did. Now, you could, you know, quite reasonably, most, in fact, most people do argue that the Australian government are bastards. And they are, <laughs> but, that, but not for this reason. Um, hundreds, literally, God knows, it could have been thousands of the people that assembled outside my, my building in, in Jakarta. A lot of them are dead, drowned on the way to uh, Christmas Island. They, they, they were just 
dying everywhere. You know, bodies floating everywhere in the coast of South Java. You know, it was just a, a complete utter disaster. But no one, and, and in, in a lot of cases, no one ever heard of them again, and no one even looked. No one knew they were gone. You know, it was just. So, what was the most compassionate thing to do? The was the, you know, to say, you know, stop all the boats, we're just not going to accept it, and you know, at least stem some of that flow. Or should should the, the Australian government have given them you know, economy class ticket? There's really no winner in this argument. <laughs> Well, see that that's but isn't that that's rather a point for it. So if you go and you 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 think it through in the in in the in a in a good way, and then compassion arises, and then it gets to the ethical bit, to the creative bit. How do you then? Uh, what do you do with it? And isn't that just the the a lovely point and that doesn't make a compassion a useless word in fact then you get compassion with compassion because you you see that you know to either way the trumpian way or the save the lives now way uh, is in itself not right or wrong but this uh, uh, might be two compassionate ways of looking at it. And then you still need to come up, up with your creative solution, what to actually do with it. And it might be very, very um, diverse. Uh, one country locks the doors and the other one sends the tickets. Um, and no one can uh, point the finger at the other's group and say, you're bastards. Um, and they can, but... And com so that then compassion is an even more important word with saying just because compassion rises up, it does not tell you what is the right way of doing it. Clearly not, because you can come to these completely diverse solutions. But you can own, you can say you came from a compassionate point. That is something. And you have to regard someone else's compassionate point with compassion and not just say you're a bastard. You, can, you, have to, to, you have to say, oh, well, that I guess is one way of dealing with it. Wouldn't be my way, but I, can, I, I have to at least give it some thought and tolerate it or uh, do something with it rather than just condemning this or that. And that's but that's where that's why I think it's a good thing to think of the the path as a creative engagement with what then arises with the compassion thrown in, but with also clear reasoning and logic thinking thrown in, and say, okay, what can we do with it? So compassion then is not a cognitive. Well, it is cognitive, but it's not a thinking process. It's a, an, a feeling which has validity, unlike other feelings which don't. <laughs> and, but we, and how do we know that's, the, that's a good one? Anyway, um, we've got, it's going to go. We have less than a minute, but it's very, that's very interesting. And I think it's offered some clarification but it's certainly offered a lot of thinking about anyway we're, i'm gonna say goodbye